Michael Ginsberg on the top right is the co-founder of Legion Paper. Michael top created left. Top, top Left. Ah, oh, see, it's different for you. Um, Michael created this webinar series to share the knowledge and creativity of today's top artisans, such as today. Uh, uh, Michael will be speaking with Brand X Editions founder and master printer Robert Blanton. Brand X specializes in silk screen printing and is renowned for its high quality of craftsmanship and impact on contemporary art. Editions produced by Brand X can be found at the Met, MoMA, the Whitney, and the Tate Gallery in London, just to name a very few. Robert is joined today by his Chromis assistant, My Miles, <laughs> sorry, Miles Austin. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael. Robert and Miles. Michael? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> Bob, you and I go back such a long time. I yeah. mean, you know, many, many, many years. And uh, last year, you celebrated a milestone, your 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of Brand X Editions, held at Pace Gallery. It was unbelievable. And um, a huge congratulations go out to you personally, and, and obviously your entire crew um, in Long Island City. Um, you have put together probably, and this is not only me, this is from publishers and from artists that I have heard and spoken to, you have put together probably the most creative, talented, and respected silkscreen atelier in the world, in the world. Uh, and the list of artists that you have printed for is just so, so long. I mean, <clears throat> Miles sent me a list and I, I'm not going to name everybody, but Alex Katz, Chuck Close, Robert Indiana, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, just to name a few of them. It, it's a journey that is so admired and, and to be respected, Bob, uh, unbelievable. And <clears throat> that said, I want to welcome you. And I want to tell you how I appreciate you really carving out this, this bit of time to spend with us and uh, share, share your journey. So hello, Robert Blanton, and hello, Miles Austin. Um, and hello, Michael, and uh, thanks for the kind words. It's, uh, it, we've been together, I think, working together since- uh, The 70s. 75. 75, e easily 75. Yeah, easily 75. And uh, so it's, it's been a long history, long history of- uh, so my, my real first question, and, and uh, <clears throat> Miles, uh, Miles Austin on the right. Hi, how are you? I'm, well. uh, I'm glad to see you wearing your mask. My first question is, is, is my, really the obvious question. With all the mediums that are out there, why silkscreen? Why silkscreen? Uh, well, if you, if you want the uh, honest answer of how I got involved in it, uh, um, when I was undergraduate school, I studied uh, printmaking and silkscreen was one of the mediums. And I'd been working construction and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I looked for a job that would uh, uh, I could I could uh, I could do. So I thought silkscreen printing. So that's how I got it. Got into doing silkscreen. Wow. wow. I came to New York and uh, I was advised by my instructor from the undergraduate wow. school that I. Um, he thought I had the skills to, to work in a uh, uh, studio like ours. Really? Wow. And I, I just pursued it. I tried it. And uh, being naive, I didn't realize how difficult it was to get into a studio like that. And I was just persistent and was able to. And that you know, was I, you know and, and, and over the last, and over the last, wow, 10, 15 years, Bob, you know, we've seen so many serograph silkscreen studios shut down close um is the is the art of silk screening um serograph fine art printing making a comeback do you think um i i, I think uh all the print mediums uh got hurt in the last 10 15 20 years um, um the uh there's just not as many uh, uh artists out there uh, when i started this uh business when I started working in silkscreen when we were dealing with uh, visual artists who were, who were painters um, they weren't uh, video artists they weren't conceptual artists they were making actual images that could translate into prints and then you know the uh, art world started changing and uh, becoming more conceptual and right. 
And at least in New York, the uh, uh, overheads became so uh, so costly that it just uh, limited the the uh, the number of artists that you could uh, afford to print. All right. That, right. Uh, that could command the prices that would pay for a project, and that's uh, uh, limited a lot. Um, a lot of a lot of studios started falling by the wayside then, and only the most established uh, uh, people were able to hang on. Yeah, yeah. You know, Miles, I I know because of the the uh, the time restraint we had <clears throat> in terms of you know being on for um you know approximately one hour. Yeah. Uh, and, and everything being virtual, I, I know that you were good enough to put together somewhat of a, a, a slide presentation of a, a virtual, literally, literally a, a virtual tour of, of the atelier. Uh, yeah, it's both. Uh, it shows the different areas of the studio and then it also kind of uh, documents the different steps of the process. When well, that would be great. You, 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 maybe we should because I, I, I do have a, a few other questions, but you know what? Why don't we start that? Okay. And then Bob, you can jump in and 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 go over, you know, what we're looking at. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Sure. So here is <clears throat> familiar face. Yeah. 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 Now, you know, you and I were kidding about this before, Bob, because one of the questions I was going to ask you, and I guess it it pertains possibly to not necessarily this one, I was going to say. How many? What was the most amount of colors that you laid down in a silk screen? Well, it uh, it was a Chuck Close image, and I don't. Rec this one would be close to it if it's if it's not the one, but um, two hundred and eight colors. Two hundred and eight, and and that's a stencil for each color. A stencil, a drawing for each color. Wow. Uh, wow. No, this it was it was not this image. This is the last image that we did. Uh, the it was the image before this one. It was two hundred and eight, and we worked on it for over four years. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Unbelievable! Yeah. So it's uh, uh, his his work. Uh, he he look he's looking for relationships. Uh, you're not trying to you know you try to match colors. But uh, he's trying to to get relationships right between the colors, so that the right. uh, um, each quadrant he works in uh, uh, groups of four squares. That each quadrant has to work uh, well, and um, so you, you just can't match a color. You're working with relationships, to, right? To do, it. Do, so, do we know? Do we know, Bob, what this was printed? What what this was printed on? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, uh, all the all the close prints that we've uh, Done have been printed on the uh, the Saunders uh, hot press four twenty five. Yeah, All right. The four twenty five gram. Yeah, Waterford. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful a piece. Or it's a beautiful piece, and water. and and it's a very stable sheet, correct? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It uh, it's uh, um, uh, it just doesn't change size, and so we can print very large pieces. We started do we got introduced to this. Uh, doing it for, for these big prints when we were doing Robert Indiana, the big Robert Indiana pieces right, right. that we needed a very stable sheet on. And we started using it then back in uh, night, like 1990. Using which, is it. When, which is when I introduced it, I think. Yeah. 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 And, and what is this? Uh, this is uh, um, an Alex Katz uh, separation. Alex does his own separations. Um, yeah, this is the key line, and, I believe. Yeah, and that's the key line, and then he has the, uh, um, it's the drawing with uh, litho crayon uh, on the edges. And uh, he'll create the edges that he wants, and even you know, the drawings around the uh, the eyes or the nose, but uh, he'll do the edges around flat shapes, and we will end up filling in the shapes uh, for him. He'll show us what we have to do, and we'll do that. But Alex, Alex still does his own separations. Wow. And, and how old is Alex now? 92, I think. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. So, so we're, we're all, we're doing very large prints for Alex these days. Very large. Yeah. And uh, this is just uh, shows the uh, laying out of uh, 
uh, positive on the screens, trying to establish the uh, the position that we want it shot in before the this coating the putting the uh, emulsion on the screen to be shot. Right. Right. And there's a, a, a coated screen in front of the light box. Um, all the lights in the our dark room is not dark, but what it what it is, it's um, the all the all the fluorescent tubes have yellow sheaths on them, so it's a yellow light which does not affect the emulsion at all, but gives us enough room to work with it. And so, even though that looks like it's being exposed to light, it's a safe light. It's a yellow light that's not affecting the emulsion. Mm -hmm. Wow. And there's the, what uh, the machines call a polycop. That's where you put your screens into, and the um, uh, unit in front of it is the light unit that will expose it. Um, and the, the light source, it's, um, and I, I just know the name. I don't know what, what all it signifies, but it's called a metal halite. And it gives off the type of uh, light, light frequencies that... Uh, Will expose the emulsion. So you're burning. You're burning the image. You're, you're, you're burning, burning the image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, burning was, was uh, started when uh, they were using carbon arc to do it, and it was right. very dangerous. And it was um, two carbon carbon rods that would uh, actually burn down uh, and give off a lot of harmful. Uh, uh, you couldn't be in the same room with it. It would uh, burn your eyes, burn your retina. Wow. Or the metal yeah. light, you can. Other than being a very bright light, it's uh, harmless. So you don't have to wear glasses or, you don't have or anything to wear glasses like that. or anything. Just uh, be in there, right? Yeah. And now the uh, the <laughs> unit that you just saw was the exposure unit that we can put, say, a screen up to. I think the outside dimensions on the screen can be like 104 inches, and we do a lot of printing that's a lot bigger than that. Yeah, how big is how big is your table, uh, Bob? Well, the table that we print on is twelve feet long. Wow! Uh, and this this frame looks like it fills up the whole table there. But what we have found that we got we had to shoot screens that could not fit in the polycop. And um, Tim Watts, who was running the studio, uh, decided that we had to come up with a different scenario on this. And we found out that the, the light unit that's above there from the suspended from the ladders is uh, a parking lot uh, lamp. Really? That <laughs> has a metal halite bulb in it. That, uh, that's what they light the parking lots with. We were able to get one of those and use our vacuum table, uh, our vacuum printing table to hold the positive tight and be able to shoot the screens. Now, what brings out the image? What is that? That the uh, that that is in a in a bath of what? Well, it's not in a bath. What you're seeing is a reflection off a piece of plexi holding okay. the positive down. But um, uh, the black is the um, it's called a positive. It creates a negative out of the screen, right. and where the light passes through the clear of the acetate of the film it hardens the emulsion and where the black is, it stays soft. And you just, we just take a hose, a hose of water and it just dissolves the emulsion that's in the screen and it washes right out. Incredible. You know, leave, leave the hardened emulsion where the clear is. Yeah. And that's uh, a, a positive that's been shot. That's a screen which is the negative, uh, the positive that was on that. Every place that you see that is yellow on there is showing you the mesh. And now, you, you, your mesh screens are made out of what, Bob? Um, it's a, uh, um, a rayon uh, uh, dichron. Um, it's a, basically a rayon mesh. Uh, and, the, and the meshes that we use, um, they can go anywhere. I mean, we've gotten some very, very coarse for some special techniques where they're a uh, uh, hundred lines of, uh, of mesh per inch. And most of the screens we use are around 200 lines per inch. Right. And the, uh, the finest when we're doing uh, halftone work, photo work, uh, very fine photo work will be a, a 300 lines per inch. 
Well, so you, that, and, that, and that's for detail. Yeah, that's yeah, that's for detail and for holding mm -hmm. the, those fine half tone photographic dots. Right. And and, and I'll, I'll just throw this out, and that's where the, you know the substrate that you're putting color down on the stability of that sheet has to be flawless. It has to be impeccable. It has to be has to be has to be impeccable, particularly on the big things. What happens with uh, art papers? Uh, um, is that uh, on a on a humid day it takes on moisture and changes size. It gets bigger. <clears throat> on a yeah. uh, a dry day, it will uh, release that moisture and get smaller. So your sheet size is changing size uh, constantly, and so you want a paper that that does not change uh, yeah. much. And particularly when you're using a a very large sheet. It can it can change quite a bit. Well, the Saunders right. that we have uh, changes very very little. Right. Very little. And, and and what you do and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, because I know that you feel strongly about stabilizing paper before you put it on, you know, before you put any ink on it at all. So what you probably do, and I and, and I've been to the studio. I know you open up the paper, you open up the packages, and you let it literally acclimate to its environment. Right. Well, we we do we take it another step further. We actually put it on the racks and let them sit overnight. Wow. So that there's air circulating all around them. So uh, hopefully each uh, each sheet is uh, uniformly sized. You know, uh, by, by taking on the same amount of moisture or releasing this <clears throat> same amount, and then each night we make sure that we either leave all the paper in the rack or we take it all out. <laughs> And cover it with uh, a, a plastic so it doesn't uh, uh, release the moisture because the top sheets will uh, take on or release more moisture than the ones underneath, which are, have weight on them. You know, there's a term, and I think you, you and I once talked about it. It's called hygroscopic, it's the yeah. ability of a paper to take on and give off moisture. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll have that more apparent in cotton fiber sheets. Yeah. So the practices that you exercise in, in the atelier is really, I mean, it's a lesson to be learned, literally. Yeah. You know, to let the paper acclimate itself to its environment, wherever it might be. Yeah. yeah. Wherever it might be. Yeah. yeah. No, it's- uh, now, what is this? Um, this is in the on the big table, but uh, you can see uh, color swatches there on the front edge of it. Um, the printer, probably Steve, uh, that's his press, uh, right. is uh, just proofing colors, getting ready to start a job. Right. So he's, he's pulling swatches to uh, to test them. Yeah. Steve's been with you for a while, Bob, right? I originally hired Steve at Styria in 1977. And then... Uh, uh, with Adi, uh, with yeah. Adi. And I left Styria a couple years later and then hired Steve again around 1990. Wow. Yeah. And this is uh, Glenn Ligon. Uh, we we're doing unique pieces with him and uh, printing and letting, uh, letting things happen to it. What we're printing here is not silk screen ink, it's an etching ink that. Uh, he, he wanted to print with because it's going to cause a very, very sticky uh, buildup on the paper. And then he coats the paper with, um, or he coats the st sticky ink with what he calls uh, coal dust, which makes a, a very grainy, uh, uh, a pebbled surface. And, and, and in the addition, is every, is every one of the prints different, Bob? On, uh, on these of Glenn's, yeah, every one was different. Wow, and wow. so it wasn't wasn't really uh, so much a uh, an addition as a group of drawings, practically. Yeah, they're like monoprints. They're like monoprints, yeah. Yeah. And that's a uh, you saw the separation uh, of Alex's that in the beginning, and that was for this print, uh, and I it's uh, and part of it. Uh, part of that drawing was uh, used here, the shading under the arm, over the shoulder. 
uh, was on that black drawing. And that's the screen that you saw, uh, that you saw the yellow openings of in the uh, screen. Right. Of right. the yellow that you saw there is the light part, and the um, is the is the dark part. I'm sorry. And the green on the screen is the light part. How many colors is that piece? That that was, uh, I think, just one color, maybe two colors. Well, there's a background color, then the uh, then that uh, tan color that was on there. There might be another couple very light ones on there. I think those prints turned out to be around 25 colors. Right. Is that usually the average? Yeah, I mean, or oh, there's no no such. There, um, Usually, I mean, you're not you're not doing 200 plus colors now. No, no, not not often. Uh, and yeah. but we, you know, we we do get into the uh, 30, 40 color range quite often. And, right. Uh, Alex's things run around 25 to 30 colors. Really? Yeah. Wow. And this is just a part of a a, a print that we're. Working, we were working on with cause, and it just shows uh, basically the chromist uh, notations for the what's called a trap. The trap is where the two colors meet, and they all you can't um, the registration can't be made for the colors kiss. You just uh, too many things are are going are going on that you'll just never hit it. So the colors right. always have to overlap a little bit, yeah. and. Uh, they're making hard to notice. I mean, literally, yeah, hard, hard to see it. You don't want the trap to show up, so you yeah. want it as small as possible, and that's what the notations on there are showing. Right. Bob, I mean, what's going on now? And we talked about this also. That addition runs are smaller. I mean, you know, like. <clears throat> when you and I were back in in, in the eighties and in, in the, the you know the early nineties, we they would uh, silk screen studios were printing two hundred pieces. Oh you know? yeah, 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 yeah. And now and now you know it's not uncommon to see a, a suite of fifteen, yeah. 10, 15, 30 at, at best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we why is that? Um, uh, I I. I, I I can't really explain it all myself, but it's uh, there was a, a big commercial push back in the back in the eighties uh, to to minimize the production cost per print. Uh, yeah, you would just you would increase the addition sizes, and you know there were there were things like Erte and Neiman and uh, mm -hmm. uh, th guys like that that were doing really large additions all the time. Chrome uh, Com Chrome Comp was one of them as well. Chroma Comp was was doing right. it, yeah, and now um, it's become uh, the industry has changed a lot. Where uh, the 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 value of prints has really became a become appreciated, mm -hmm. and they're doing uh, the publishers are doing whatever they can to make these things rare, to to make them valuable. Uh, so hence the smaller the edition, really. smaller the edition, yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, you know, say it costs twenty thousand dollars to do an edition, uh, and you're doing um, thirty prints. It costs twenty thousand dollars to do it, and wow. they say, "Well, what? How much would it cost to do an edition of sixty instead of 30? Yeah. And you go, "Well, basically, it'll cost uh, uh, it'll cost five thousand dollars more plus the paper. So you're paying twenty five thousand for the job for twice the number of prints as opposed to twenty. Uh, right. Uh, right. So the cost per piece comes down. Right. Bob, do you think digital imaging, fine art digital imaging had an impact as well? I mean, in terms of, you know, smaller editions for silk screen, given the fact that on digital, you can literally print on demand, you know, one piece, two pieces, that's it. Yeah. See, I, um, I haven't given that, I haven't uh, considered that before, um, but uh, I know digital is becoming, um, the price point on digital is becoming much more interesting to people uh, than it than it was before, because um, uh, overheads have driven up the cost of doing a cat's print or a clothes print uh, to the point where 
uh, it's ruling out the entry level buyer all, altogether. Mm. And so now um, digital is becoming uh, really popular or, uh, and what we're experimenting with is a, is a digital silk screen combination wow. where we can do uh, part of the uh, uh, complicated print, cut down the number of colors in a print from 25 or 30 to five or six. Mm -hmm. uh, and Miles, is that what we're looking at now? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you no. say that? No, no, this is Helen Frankenthal. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, this is a print that we, we did for her for uh, Bill, uh, Bill Bell, the museum in Spain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Got it. Uh, she, drew, she drew the plates for this. And uh, we're, uh, she's just inspecting it, coming up with uh, uh, you know, uh, her approval or her corrections. Right. You know, I mean, getting back to uh, getting back to digital versus silkscreen. <clears throat> Personally, I, I feel silkscreen's got, uh, for lack of a better way to express it, much more sizzle or sex appeal mm -hmm. than digital print. Even though you know, it, digital is very popular. I know. Well, it's uh, you have uh, you can get a much richer surface. Uh, you can get uh, uh, the color saturation. Uh, better so it's um i, th I think it's it's a, a much more um a sensual richer uh medium uh yeah. than the digital i know when it first started we were uh, uh digital first started we were working with chuck close and we would get a high quality digital print made uh for it and uh, to work just to work from to use as a reference and by the time we finished the silk screen and compared it, there's absolutely no comparison uh, to, to them. But digital printing has come a long way since then, and it yeah. would be much, much better now. As well as the substrates, too. As well as the silk screen. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, you know, looking at our, uh, <clears throat> looking at our Moab digital range and our, you know, uh, <clears throat> Canson Infinity range, um, the beautiful papers, beautiful yeah. papers. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's interesting that you're doing a, a combo of digital and serigraph. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, we uh, we're having a really good success with it. Um, uh, we did a print with uh, Troy Michi for that. We did the portfolio for our 40th anniversary, and we did a print with Troy Michi that uh, uh, he he worked from a collage. Well, we. Uh, did a digital print of it. And then I forget how we added a, uh, I think at least a dozen colors to it to enrich in the surface and make it, uh, 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 just to make it richer, make it a more full, more full image. And it uh, changed it so much. And it, uh, the print's gotten uh, a very good reception. Very good right. reception. Now your, your rings, <clears throat> cause I remember back then <clears throat> we were oil based. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What are you What are you using now? We We still use oil base. Uh, you do. And one of the reasons we still use oil base is, um, um, well, it's, I'm used to it. Number one, but yeah. um, uh, our big prints, uh, we talk about the stability of the paper. Uh, if we try, in my opinion, right? right. Somebody, uh, somebody may be able to tell me that uh, there's a different uh, between water-based and oil-based but in my opinion you add a, a large layer of water-based uh, ink down onto a large sheet of paper and it's going to change so size radically right you. and po very possible very it, possible uh, it doesn't happen with the oil-based inks so we do so many big things uh, uh, we, i think the uh, the biggest Alex Katz we did was like a, a hundred and six inches long, something Jeez. like that. Um, would be uh, it would be really difficult. And I know that uh, you use if you're using water-based inks on uh, a screen, a big screen, it can actually uh, the screen takes on moisture and it gets the tension and it gets loose. It'll dry back out and get tight again, but right. uh, that would affect your registration too. On smaller images, um, uh, it's uh, not not the problem that we have. Mm, interesting. And, uh, 
I, I can pull up the print we did mixing both digital and silk screen. Yeah, let, if you can do that, Miles, that would be great. Yes. Uh, this is the this is the Troy Beachy. Yeah. Now uh, you 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 do what you obviously digital first, Bob, right? Right. We do the digital first, and then we uh, you know we do separations just like we would for any other print, and then we start. Um, uh, printing back on top of it on the um, like on the red uh, the you know kind of maroony red around the edges we, we put it on there we put it on the blacks printed whites down on the white uh, the uh, bright red uh, printed on that um, there's a uh, uh, the gray on the background on the spot up in the corner yeah. we printed there there's a collage piece running down the uh, right-hand side of the piece where it's uh, uh, a piece of Japanese paper collaged onto it that we did some very subtle printing on top of it. I don't know if it, I can't. It's, like a, it's almost like a shin kole. Oh, that, that, yeah, almost the technique was almost like a shin kole. Yeah. Yeah. How many colors of each, Bob? How many digital and how many silk screen? Well, uh, I think uh, Miles is our, our printer, our digital printer, six or so colors. Uh, our digital printer has uh, eight different color cartridges. Okay, eight, eight, eight uh, different cartridges on the digital printing. And I think there's about a dozen uh, silkscreen colors printed on this one. Yeah. And I, I think the digital substrate you were using, what, what was it, Intrada? Intrada, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great paper. We, it's uh, been working very, very well for us. Yeah. Prints beautifully. Yeah. Prints beautifully. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I think that's going to be uh, going to be utilized more and more. Uh, combination, the combo. The combination, yeah. Yeah. Do you find also some of the art? I mean, we talked about it earlier on one of your pieces, that black piece, where <clears throat> on smaller editions, they're literally doing, um, as, as I call it, monoprints, where they're taking. Uh, you, you know, you'll do a silk screen image, and then they'll each one will be different. They'll they'll build up. They'll do like a like almost like a collagraph. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we've, we've done we've done uh, over through the years we've done quite a few of those. We did uh, 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 good good model prints with with various artists and just changing the colors uh, and sometimes even the artist drawing on the screen and then us printing it uh, through there applying the ink and splotches on there and then letting it, letting it smear out. But now I, I know Pace is doing a lot of mono prints uh, uh, in their print shop. So there, right. there's, there's a lot of mono prints going on. Right. Right. And, 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 and they're, um, that's etching, right? Is it? Well, no, they, they do a lot of relief printing, a lot of relief printing. Uh, a relief. Yeah. Okay. Wood, wood cut linoleum. Right. Yeah. Right. Bob, you know, uh, given what we're all living through now, you know, in terms of the pandemic, I mean, everything being virtual, I mean, where do, where do you see, where do you see the art world going? I mean, where do you, what do you think is, what do, because it's, and nothing is going to settle down through, my feeling is through 21. I mean, everything is still going to be virtual. I mean, um, yeah. Well, one of the thing, one of the things, uh, it, you know, uh, that it's the marketplace has been affected a lot. Uh, last year, uh, we were members of uh, we jo we joined in in two two art fairs, two digital art fairs, uh, and uh, was very successful in them. And people were turning to uh, uh, getting confidence in buying things online. Uh, Whereas before, you know, you have a twenty thousand dollar print or a, uh, uh, you know, something that costs a significant amount of money, yeah. and people want to really put their eyes on it. And, uh, yeah, you want to see it up close and personal, without a doubt. Right, and so um, uh, the, that that shyness is uh, falling away a lot, and so there's a, a lot more mm -hmm. sales online. Um, with us, we you know we we've all we've, for years now we've been uh, just uh, doing electronic uh, transfers of images and stuff and showing people proofs online you know, not online necessarily but through emails and uh, um, 
uh, digital representations. But when it comes right down to the artist wanting to see the work, we right. go, we go to their studio or they come to us. Uh, really, really, so they can really see it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I see it affecting more the marketplace than it uh, than it will uh, what we're doing. Yeah, the Miami Basel show was huge, uh, and, you know, and it's going to go virtual this year. I mean, I, I, I've been told that they will have a small segment of the show that will be live. You okay. know, that will be I don't, I don't know how they're going to be able to pull it off, yeah, yeah. you know, with social distancing and all that. But yeah. they're going to try. Yeah. They're going to try. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know the, 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 you know, since I'm in the print business, the IFPDA fair is the big print fair in New York every uh um november and uh they didn't have it this year they they substituted with one in may and then uh and they and they had another digital fair uh for the month of october the fairs are running longer since you don't have to rent a space but uh it's uh the marketplace it's really affecting the marketplace right right you know uh, uh miles we didn't talk about we didn't talk about you at all. I mean, Bob is, you know, the main but, but you do an interesting thing. Maybe, maybe Bob can, can go a little bit into, I mean, I know you can, but you know, uh, from a Chromis standpoint, um, what do you, what is, what does a Chromis actually do? I mean, I, I kind of make it, and this is a, this is always my, my standard line. I mean, it's like the Thomas crown affair, you know, where you're replicating, an original work of art as close as possible to the original work of art on, on, a, on a mylar or on a, on a, uh, on a, another substrate. Yeah. I mean, the, the basic intention of a good chromist is to preserve the integrity of the artist's line and the artist's work. So you, you never want to commit an act when you're chroming or creating a positive image that does not accurately reflect the original intention of the artist. So whether that be digitally, when we're outputting it through one of our uh, large, large form mm -hmm. printers, or if you're doing something by hand, it's it's all about preserving that that uh, that original gesture or that original line. So your background or your talent has to be you have to be an art you have to be an artist. Uh, yeah, I went to uh, school for. For art, and I actually studied under uh, Joe Stauber, who was a chromist at Brand X for many, many years. Wow. That's how okay. I was introduced to the studio. Interesting. Yeah. Now, one of the, one, when we were uh, looking at that Chuck Holtz print and talking about the relationships that he uh, uh, insists on in that. Can we, can, we get, can we get back to that piece, uh, that first piece? Yeah. Just give me a moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that Chuck is so uh, uh, concerned about was that uh, his, just like what Miles was talking about, in preserving the integrity of uh, the artist's work, the artist's mark. Chuck wanted to make sure that all the marks on the on these pieces look like marks that he would make, look like a Chuck Close mark, and not something that Joe Stauber. And Joe, Joe did a couple of the Chuck Holses, uh, or one of the other Chromas, not not their hand, but his hand. Right. So, um, uh, and, you're, you're, and, and and Bob, let me ask you this: How much, you know, I mean, from an artist interaction with your printer and your Chromas, I mean, are they really deeply involved? Deeply involved. And the reason well, I say that is, and, and to my point. If you take somebody, and I, I'm not going to mention any names, you know, but <clears throat> there have been artists that have a have a crew, literally have a crew, and, and it's like yeah. almost like they'll do the outline of the piece, and they'll say, "Okay, boys, come on in and fill in the lines." Yeah. Well, um, we, you know, it depends on the artist that you're working with, and lots of times, you know, an artist who's uh, we've worked with artists like that who say, "Here's the piece. Call me when it's done." And, really? uh, and, and then they, and they sign it. Yeah, and they sign it. <laughs> now, Chuck, okay, I told you we did a 208 color print. We took it to him. We took it to his studio every 10 colors. Really? Wow. For him to, to take a look at it and tell us what's going on. Um, 
And in the beginning, say for the first, uh, on the first print we did, uh, it was a black and white print, uh, which turned out to be 80 colors, 80 shades of the grays and the different uh, uh, hues of the grays. Um, he would, uh, uh, he started saying, it looks awfully warm to me because we had put down a very warm uh, tan underneath everything. And Joel was working on that print. And as long as he was saying it looks awfully warm to him, it didn't disturb us because we had a plan that was going to take, taking that in consideration. And right. if he came up with something else that's, that said, you know, that we weren't expecting, then, then it would make us nervous. But uh, uh, he was always giving us direction on what we were doing. The, the, uh, the mark, uh, he was never concerned about the shape of the mark because we always had that. But the rhythm of the piece, the way the colors work, uh, the relationships of the piece, of the colors, uh, was all very important to him. And he kept, he kept after us the whole time on that. Um, Alex is much the same way. Alex will look at the pieces. And um, uh, we've worked with Alex so long for so many years now that he's not as he draws the separations. And then he uh, has confidence in us that we can do the work. And he'll step back and we'll take him a proof and knowing that it will be 95% um, there and or even more. And he'll <laughs> he'll change the value of something, but he won't uh, we won't have to reproof. There's one one print in the last 15 years that we have had to reproof. And he he was basically laughing at me, saying, this is the worst proof that I've seen you guys bring into me. Oh, and really? He was he was tickled by it. He was glad that uh, you know, and we just didn't have the right stuff to work, right reference material to right, work on. Right. So we uh, did what we could, and we blew it. We blew it once, once out of uh, dozens of prints, and we reproofed it gladly. We reproofed it. <laughs> did you know it before going there? Uh, I knew. I knew that it was. We we were having, um, we we were having issues, but. Um, one of the things about the studio is uh, uh, if we're not happy with the piece, it doesn't matter to us what the artist says. Right. Uh, we will. Uh, You'll catch it immediately. We'll catch it immediately. And if there's something technical, like a trap size, right? Yeah. Uh, that uh, it doesn't affect the overall aesthetics, the colors or the relationships or the shapes or anything. But the trap is wrong and we're, we don't like it. The artist may not point that out to us. We'll change it ourselves and make it make it better in the addition. Uh, so there's uh, and but if we're not happy with the piece, we we don't show it to the artist. But we on the cat's piece, we were just lost. We were doing the best we could, and we knew well it's time for the artist to step in and give us some direction. Was that that big piece of of his uh, of his wife? No, 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 no. It was a it was a, a floral piece that we did. Okay, uh, that we just didn't have the. Uh, the proper reference material to work from. What what has been probably the most difficult piece that you've ever done? What who is the artist, Bob? Ah, uh, um, one of the most. Uh, well, not in terms of personality. I'm no, no, no. Uh, uh, the the Jeff Koons metal pieces were maybe the most challenging, difficult pieces that we had to do had to work with. Uh, yeah. They were uh, the uh, the last ones we did were were uh, cut out balloon monkeys that were uh, nine and a half feet tall and uh, 10 feet wide. And uh, we had to print them in sections and it was on metal and uh, we had to create a clean room in the studio for it uh, that was isolated from the rest of the studio uh, to keep the dust because you, you get a, a speck of dust on a, a, a paper sheet that doesn't really show up because wow. it just kind of soaks into everything. You get a speck of dust on a piece of metal and it's sitting right on top and shows up. Yeah. And, uh, we would, uh, the monkeys were like uh, 25 colors that we have to do and we'd be um, uh, 15 colors into it and something wouldn't work right. It, all unique, they were unique pieces also. Something wouldn't work out and we'd have to wash it off and start it over again. Really? And wow. one of these pieces, uh, we probably washed off a dozen, 15 times. Uh, really? Uh, 
And then, you know, there were five different color variations of these monkeys. And uh, one of them we had to wash off a dozen, 15 times. Another one, we hit it on the first try, just walk really? right through it. You know, really? so that's just the way, uh, uh, the way it works sometimes. Yeah, I wonder what corporate lobby those are in now. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. And they weigh, they weigh, they were weighing 600 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. We would have to. Yeah. Bob, how do you ship that? I mean, you know, talk talk to me about shipping. Like the Alex Katz piece. I mean, you you literally have to build a crate. We right? build a crate uh, uh, to uh, to ship these to the publisher. Uh, the crate is built. Uh, now the the Jeff Koons things. Uh, the art movers brought the uh, the cut out piece of metal in. Uh, a number of guys picked it up, put it on the table, and it sat there until we finished it. And then the art movers came back in, picked it up and put it in a crate and took it out. Wow. Yeah. So that was just something we were not, you know, uh, we weren't prepared to handle. Yeah. Yeah. And and interleaving wise, uh, I think we talked about this a little bit. You use uh, an acid free glycine. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Or or, or you're using the, the legion. That legion uh, special interleaving that I made. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, sixty inch wide roll. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a good that's a good one. The interleaving. Uh, yeah. Or we or we'll use the uh, acid free glassine. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> who who's new, Bob? I mean, who's? Uh, who? There's the. Uh, is, is that it? Yeah. That's one of the monkey. That's one of the uh, balloon monkeys. Mm-hmm. Wow! And uh, to print that was uh, the way it was split. The tail was split off on the screens. It came in as one piece of metal, but the tail was split off. We printed the body, and then we printed the uh, tail separately. And uh, when we're printing, we're uh, um, there's a printer on either side of the table pushing the squeegee. And now, how many colors? I know it's not just blue, Bob. How many colors is this? Well, I think there there were about count. You know, uh, on the body itself, there were about twenty different uh, printings of different blues and shades of uh, to get the values right uh, and get everything blending right. And then we had the same values and stuff to print on the tail, like but less of them. Say another ten on the tail. Right. Amazing, yeah. amazing piece. Yeah, amazing piece. Yeah. Huh. So who who is new and and who who do we look for that, that's up and coming? That um, well, you know, we um, you're doing a lot of cause, right? We're doing a lot of cause, uh, um, and we're doing a lot of Adam Pendleton. Uh, a lot of unique pieces for Adam. Um, that. Uh, um, really really becoming an important artist he was supposed to have an opening at the uh, museum of modern art um back in july but it got yeah. canceled and, but it's been postponed until 21 so he'll be doing that um, hopefully um jonathan chaplin is uh, uh, a young artist that's going to be making some good waves um we'll go hopefully starting a piece with him soon um uh miser uh, yeah, you know uh, on stonehenge Bill messler yeah messler on, on stonehenge fawn yep yep no we we've done um now he's a, he, um, a young artist uh, getting established now uh, uh, and he's got a gallery out here he's got a gallery here he's uh, gonna be having a big show in uh, la uh, really uh yeah at uh, at david koransky uh, gallery uh-huh He's going to be there. Uh, He's got rental gallery in East Hampton. He's a rental gallery in East Hampton. And um, uh, he, he's a very, uh, a, a very interesting artist, very, very good artist. Uh, another artist that we uh, work with is Rashid Johnson, who is uh, uh, younger but very well established with Hauser and Worth uh, in, uh, in Chelsea. Um, so it's... Um, and we we've, we've done. He was in the uh, Rashid was in, and and Joel were both in the uh, anniversary portfolio that we did. 
Right, right, right. Yeah. So getting back to my original question, silk screen's coming back strong. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is. Yeah, it is. And one of the one of the things when I first started, everybody wanted a litho. They didn't they didn't want silk screen. Um, they wanted a flatbed litho. They wanted a flatbed litho. They didn't they didn't want silk screen. Now the technologies and everything have changed so much in silk screen. Um, uh, the 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 medium is so broad now yeah. that uh, the the there are practically no limitations. We we uh, that's what I tell people when they come in. I said we well you, you, we have so many options. We have to start narrowing it down. Yeah. So that uh, so we can get get something started, and then we can always change. But there's so many options, and silk screen is um, of the of the print mediums, I, but I, I think the uh, the one that's really up and coming right now is digital. Uh, it's just because the the silk screen, um, silk screen litho etching, is just so expensive to do now. The overhead has gotten to be so high. Yeah, to do it. Yeah. And the quality of digital is is uh, getting better and better. You know, with you know, um, we're, we're seeing we're seeing it being very very strong market. Yeah, very strong market. Very strong uh, market, and and we yeah. hope that we hope that we can enhance it by adding uh, real combination printing. Well, that's it. That's another dimension. You know, you know, I have to tell you, I'm surprised by it. It's the first time because I know that we sell you the Moab and Trotto, mm -hmm. um, and it's the first time that I've heard that you do the combo. I thought it was just purely a silk screen. Uh, excuse me, a digital image, and and it was it was not a combination of both. Uh, both processes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's great. Yeah. In in the past, uh, we would have to uh, uh, do a four color process underneath with uh, right, right, and then print silk screen on top of it, and and you know it, you, it was a, a compromise in the photo reproduction. Silk screen is, is good, but it's not not that good at the photo reproduction. Uh, part. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But Mark, you've been very very quiet. No, you've been answering most of the questions. There's a few questions uh, regarding digital, which is a uh, perfect time to ask. Uh, Susan is asking about whether digital prints are considered an original since it's reproducible. And um, she just mentioned that when she was at the Armory exhibit last March, she saw a lot of digital prints. What's your comment on that? Um, yeah, but, um, I, th I think it's it's up to the uh, integrity of the uh, artist and the uh, publisher to uh, to limit them so that they're not like doing uh, um, not like a paperback book just like running off as many copies as you want um, uh, the uh, silk screen was criticized for a long time it's just when we were well working with uh, a chromist working with uh, a print well you're just doing a reproduction of the painting well, no, we're not doing a reproduction of the painting. We're doing an interpretation, and we're trying to save all the uh, uh, the real essence of the artist's work and keep keep true to the artist's uh, intent uh, to relay a, a, a true interpretation of the piece. And uh, digital digital falls in, in into that same way. You know, it's uh, not just. And it depends on the integrity of the people doing the, and the intention behind um, making the print. Yeah, but you also have the flexibility, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, to have the artist embellish as, as he goes or as you print. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, even from the original piece of art, you know, you can just say, wow, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I have a different idea how I want this the silk screen piece to, to be reflective of my original piece and he can go off on a tangent just go off on a tangent right right and and the and the uh and the artists that are involved in the works um uh, like, like chuck uh he doesn't want a straight reproduction of his piece he wants it to have a life of its own and if it starts right. veering off um right. you know, if it starts going off to the side uh, yeah. on its own as long as it's working for chuck he's happy with that you know right. so <laughs> Um, right. And many times an artist will will just uh, steer it that way. Um, yeah. I mean, Miles, do you get involved in, in the Chromis work for digital as well? Oh, uh, yeah. A lot of 
the the chroming work now involves uh, working digitally through through files and then outputting them onto large film positives and then yeah. it's always going to be hand like additions or subtractive work to do once it's been printed but yeah working in adobe and working digitally is a huge part of the job wow mark uh, uh how are we on time i mean yeah we got a few more minutes and there's some questions on paper back to the paper because robert you had mentioned specifically with the chuck close prints that you're using saunders waterford uh for those um Prints. What other papers have you used, and what do you look for in a paper? And uh, if you can give some advice on that. Um, it, uh, well, it, uh, the uh, artist has a lot to do with uh, the selection of the papers. Um, when on, on basic silk screen, we're looking for a surface that we can use. Um, there's some standard papers that we use, like Reeves or Arsh or Stonehenge, Somerset. They're uh, they're all very good papers. Um, they we they need to be archival. That's probably, uh, if not the biggest uh, uh, detail. Uh, it's it's right up there, ranks right right up there because it has to be archival to be able to last in, in what we're right. doing. Right. Um, um, the surface is very important. The stability is very important. Um, we, you know, and we'll we'll go off to specialty papers too. We'll go into handmade papers sometimes if if the uh, uh, project uh, requires it. Yeah. Right. But you lean, I mean, over, over the last years, you've been leaning toward more of a smoother surface. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Unless an, an, unless an artist uh, is once a, 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 a textured surface, yeah. we're, we're, we're pushing towards a, a very smooth paper like the Saunders. Um, Somerset, it, Somerset. We've moved away from Arsh even because it has a, a, a little bit of texture. texture. Well, if we're, you know, we'll go, we'll go to more towards Reeves than we will to Arsh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because it, it makes our job just a little bit easier. The, the screen prints a little bit sharper. Details come out just a little bit sharper. But Arsh is a fantastic paper too. And if, and if the image um, requires it, uh, Arsh is a great paper. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, I I have to tell you, my uh, Robert, uh, I I can't thank you enough. I I really, I mean, you know, sharing your time, sharing a little bit of your journey. Uh, you look great. <laughs> I know you. I know you just. I'm not even going to go to your birthday because I know yeah. you just celebrated one. <clears throat> but uh, I really thank you, and I appreciate all <clears throat> all the time you gave us today. Really. Well, well, well thank you. <laughs> For having me it's um it's been a, a real real nice experience i appreciate it and mike thank Be you bye-bye